The year is 2007. You're playing with that Cybertron Optimus, waiting for the next... That was cool, but you're still waiting for the next cartoon on TV. It's been a sort of constant in your life, and the movie wasn't really a replacement of that. The movie had a yellow guy named Bumblebee, but at this point you're used to a yellow guy named Hotshot. <laughs> Ironhide was an old guy in that movie, but you knew him as a rookie in that one show you always caught the ending credits <laughs> in. And who the fuck were Jazz and Ratchet to you? So yeah, you're thinking, that's the movie, let's get back to normal Transformers stuff on TV. That was a familiar place. Boobies. But after messing around on the internet, you find this place called YouTube. And people are talking about this thing called Transformers Anime. And we are kicking off the animated series with the premiere of the hour and a half Transformers animated special. The day after Christmas at 8 p.m. So this must be what people are talking about now. This was different. But you liked it, you loved it. The bad guys were scarier this time. The action was super dynamic. The good guys felt unique. Now, of course, you're also nine, so you didn't think any of that stuff. You just went X go swoosh. And you saw the toys, they were filled with so much personality and life. It was an invitation for old fans and new fans alike. This was the first Transformers show that I made sure I caught every episode of once they aired. And boy, I I loved it. I loved it so fucking much. Over the summer, I stayed with my grandparents and I wasn't able to catch the final two episodes of season two, so I kept scouring Wikipedia to find out what happened. I looked and read up on literally every Transformers character. That was the summer I really got into the franchise. The season finales were legendary. The character growth was amazing. The Easter eggs were fantastic. Transform and Rollout and Transwarped were epic movies. But most importantly, the world was beyond your wildest imagination. The political intrigue, the new ideas, the old ideas, the voices, everything was just so perfect. Total well, outage. Almost everything was just so perfect. And then it ended. Now before we get straight into Transformers Animated proper, let's take some time to look at what came right before. Simply put, TFA was devised as a superhero show with the Transformers. It was meant to be in the same vein as Teen Titans and Ben 10. The superhero angle gives our characters a unique relationship to their adopted planet. What if Superman was an ordinary guy on Krypton that came to Earth? as an adult. Something I noticed about the character design for Animated was that, unlike previous shows, it emphasized the cartoony aspect of the characters far more. Um, in my very first meeting with Sam said, now I want to call it Sam Transformers Animated because we're doing it like a cartoon. We're a cartoon network, it's going to be a cartoon, and it'll, it'll feel completely different from any other Transformers show. So I kind of think, well, what would Disney's Transformers <laughs> feel like you know what would hanna-barbera's transformers feel like i think you saw a lot of that in, in derek's designs if you've seen the movie robots the initial designs don't look too far off from that they're rather interesting to me has a sort of iron giant vibe to them somewhere down the line a lot more classic transformers aspects were introduced partly to coincide with the michael bay movie partly because certain things that weren't on the table before are Earlier in the process, Hotshot and Red Alert were part of the cast, but were then replaced with Bumblebee and Ratchet. Hotshot was changed to Bumblebee also because Hasbro finally acquired the trademark for the character after losing it for at least a decade, which is probably why they're so keen on to using him so much these days. Jetfire and Jetstorm seemed to be devised as part of the main cast initially, but were subsequently removed and saved for later. Reading Marty Eisenberg's production bible, a lot of the show's original superhero vision can be seen in the first season especially. You might want to look both ways before you cry. You get a whole league of supervillains, which to be honest, I didn't take quite so seriously, but at least they culminated in the appearance of Swindle in season 2. But as for that superhero nature of of our Autobot cast. I love that. It was nice to see that the Autobots were saving people as well as fighting the bad guys. I especially liked that the Autobots had to fix the collateral damage brought upon by the Decepticons and their battles. It's something I wish was in more TF media. Fixing bridges? Isn't this where we started out? 
And yeah, as superheroes, they're technically not robots in disguise, but to be honest, I'm fine with them eschewing that in the original show, and I'm fine with them doing that here. The human-robot interactions are more fun that way to me. You still want that ride, or what? We'll, we'll call, call a cab! cab. Hmm. Not even a thank you. The superhero proportions and aesthetic is also evident in the art style. Derek J. Wyatt did the character designs that we see in the final result. I love these designs. If you were like me as a kid, you'd spend hours upon hours just searching up stuff on the TF Wiki, including looking up Wyatt designs for nearly every character you can think of, whether it came from the AllSpark Almanac or as a sketch from somewhere else. But seriously, the character design combines a sort of Pixar-esque caricature with the original character with references to other things to give it some fun and personality. It feels like something you see in a newspaper where maybe Sentinel had a big chin in real life, but a political cartoonist exaggerated that part of him to showcase his big-headedness. And yeah, I don't mind the chins. There's something about that aspect in particular that I like. I think it's because it reminds me of political caricatures in newspapers and how animated is not shy about the political thriller aspects introduced in the later seasons, which only becomes more and more evident as the show goes on. And I think the show gets better and better because of it. There's all these machinations going on and makes the show so much more intriguing episode to episode. The Autobot Decepticon dynamic this time around was that the Autobots have won the war. The Decepticons who did not seek amnesty were exiled, pining for the opportunity to reclaim their homeworld. The Decepticons being this fanatical army who want to control Cybertron for themselves is absolutely brilliant. They keep them in the shadows for a long time. And because it's not two armies and one army is losing every episode, the Decepticons feel like more of a threat. I also like that the Autobot-Decepticon divide is more that the Autobots are civilians with tools and gadgets as weapons, while the Decepticons have big laser blasters and cannons. The world building in this show is amazing, and if you haven't, check out some of the animated almanacs and other material. It's so flushed out. But yeah, the Decepticons, they're so much more fearsome this time around. Megatron, especially. Starscream Report. Megatron starts to show out as this monster, and you're like, Optimus and his crew are no match for this thing, this warlord, this killing machine. Upon his first matchup, he's not taken out by the Autobots, but by his own cowardly, sniveling second in command. Yes! And then he's just ahead. Okay, so imagine someone told you, Hey, yeah, so uh, Megatron's gonna be ahead for a third of the show. <sighs> Isaac Sumdak, a kind of Thomas Edison, uh, I guess you would say Nikola Tesla, Bill Gates sort of figure, who reverse engineered Megatron's head to create a vast multi-million dollar empire, which revitalizes Detroit in the 22nd century. Eventually, Megatron, now just ahead, is revived and tries to figure out a way to get a new body to capture the AllSpark. So he tricks Isaac into thinking that he's one of the Autobots, and by fixing him up, Sumdak can relieve himself of the guilt he feels for profiting off of the Cybertronian race's technology. It's a fantastic setup. The first thing Megatron does is reprogram a drone to go after the AllSpark. Animated Megatron takes a lot of cues from the Beast Machines version. Some of the contraptions and devices he makes are the basis for the villains of the week, such as Nanosec, initially the Dinobots who get a nice updated origin this time around, being animatronics infused with a spark, Although, I wish Grimlock wasn't the only one who talked, but given that this was my first experience with the Dinobots, this was such a huge reveal when I was a kid. There's also Soundwave, who I'm not a big fan of this time around, mostly because he feels like a throwaway villain oftentimes. 
defeated way too easily. Although I am a big fan of the idea of him creating dreams and his design is a pretty good update to the original. I just feel he's way underutilized and given way too few appearances. Because I love the idea of Megatron creating the ideal Decepticon in Soundwave. Musing to him what it means to be a Decepticon. Having him believe so forcefully in the cause. Essentially creating a mini version of himself. I am Soundwave. I am Decepticon. But again, Megatron's just ahead for 12 episodes, crafting all sorts of machinations to get his way until he realizes the only way to achieve Decepticon victory is to get his other Decepticons fully involved, even though he may have some trust issues. It shows how tactical, deceptive, intelligent that he is just able to achieve so much. Now we should talk about who put him in that position in the first place. In the production bible, Starscream is described as like Scar from The Lion King, and yeah, he definitely feels like the type of guy to push his brother off a cliff into some stampeding wildebeest. The way I describe Starscream is to imagine the G1 version, but everything's amplified. He's not only physically stronger, but he's also far more arrogant and conniving, but also stupid, weirdly enough. He betrays Megatron slickly, but then gets killed, but wait, he's actually immortal because of the allspark in his head, which is a far greater execution of the idea of a Starscream ghost being immortal than in G1. He creates an army of clones like the Seekers to take down Megatron, but that backfires. Kinda like how he created Combaticons, but that backfired on him. But I think the peak of these two's rivalry is in Season 3, where they're forced to work together. Stop staring at me. No, you stop staring at me. This Starscream with that amazing voice by Tom Kenny is fantastic. He encompasses everything a Starscream should be. Megatron! Did you just say Megatron? Did he just say Megatron? There is no Megatron! Megatron is offline! Terminated! I did it myself! Saw it myself! The other Decepticons are likewise pretty cool. Lugnut, absolutely adore him. Blitzwing, a lot of fun. Black Arachnia is a great update. Team Char was pretty cool. I'd love to see more of them. The Constructicons are a riot, and I'd love to see them combine into Devastator. And Shockwave, a great twist. Another great update to the character, being the one Decepticon on Cybertron. Swindle is fantastic too. Really solidified himself outside of the Combaticons. And I could go on and on, but the Decepticons were just awesome. But once Megatron returns in an amazing updated design, that's when we really start to see him not only as a master manipulator, but also an intelligent strategist and a fierce warrior. And it's all perfectly punctuated with Corey Burton's bone chilling performance, dripping with wariness, coldness, and intelligence with every word. It's not the best you could do, Starscream. And to think you actually believed you could take over as leader of the Decepticons. You couldn't lead a parade. But what's his motivation? Megatron is a true Machiavellian, doing whatever it takes to achieve victory, which means Cybertron under his despotic rule. But the Autobots weren't and aren't so clean themselves, with their own weapons of mass destruction opportunists, and are completely vulnerable to inside attacks. Only to have a grandiose goofball take control and shift Cybertron for the worst. Yeah, Megatron is the main bad guy in everything, but Sentinel does some real shady stuff. He lays the blame for his idea at his friend so he can continue with his career and get promoted, gets incredibly xenophobic about organic. We should return to the ship, sir. Every moment we're out here, we risk organic contamination. <laughs> and spreads that xenophobia throughout Cybertron. What are you looking at? It's organic. What have they done to Cybertron? Declares martial law on the planet. Decepticons are in our midst. Neighbors, friends, even your own model can be a spy. Attempted to blow up Omega Supreme. What you did was reckless and in complete disregard for the rule of Autobot law. 
And I'd do it again if it means saving Cybertron from the enemy. If it was up to me alone, you'd never get that chance. Dealt with a bounty hunter and tried to steal the credit for his own glory. But I don't only say that because Sentinel's a huge douchebag. I also say that because from the start, Optimus's crew are derided by the other Autobots because they repair space bridges for a living. It's not seen as a glamorous job. So what we have is the everyman versus the elite. You feel for each of them as they try to prove themselves to a society that won't accept them. And when karma strikes the elitists, you feel a bit of a catharsis. <laughs> you promised you wouldn't laugh! I... <laughs> Sorry. Okay, but who are these everymen? No, that's the wrong question. Who is this? Family. Uh, I know I may be big and crush stuff. Accidentally. Oh. But I have a sensitive side too. Bulkhead starts out as a gentle giant. He's big and he breaks stuff. But you see his passion for art and building and engineering over the course of the show. And this all pays off when it turns out he's actually one of the smartest of the team, being exceptional in space bridge building technology. According to his file, he scored higher than any Cybertronian scientist on his space bridge aptitude test. He's often overlooked because he's not quite as knowledgeable in most other things or he doesn't carry himself in quite the same way someone like a wheeljack or a perceptor might. He's constantly doubted. People underestimate his other attributes like kindness and intelligence because all they see him as is a bot who destroys property and ruins parties, when in reality, his most valuable skills are creating art and building bridges. That's what saves the day. See, Ratchet? Art can save people. But most importantly, his best skill is being a compassionate and true friend. I wish I could tell him how much our friendship has meant to me, even if he never dreamed big. But I did dream big, Bumblebee. I dreamed of being your friend. Given that he's not a legacy character and has such strong characterization, it's actually quite impressive how they took a character that could have been simply a big, strong brawler and made him into a gentle giant in quite a poetic fashion. It goes to show, never judge a book by its cover. And welcome back, big guy. I was just doing what I do. I'll admit. Prowl starts out as one of my least favorites. He just put a damper on everything, had this annoying loner attitude. Prowl is someone who starts his journey as a selfish bot who doesn't ditch the war because it's morally wrong or anything, but because it's someone else's problem. Why should I risk my chassis for anyone? Nobody ever risks their chassis for me! Keeping you out of the stockade. I am risking something for you. He was sent to Master Yokotron instead of being locked up in the stockade, and he made strides learning to fight for others, but his path wasn't complete. He never quite learned how to get along with others. He never learned how to think beyond himself. He tried to save his past by sacrificing someone else's future. Master No, I need you online. You must not sacrifice a piece of the future to bring back the past. In between being fascinated by nature, he starts to realize what being a team player is all about, what it means to be part of a family, and more importantly, what it means to think beyond himself. Initially, he sees his fellow bots as noisy and undisciplined, but he would eventually come to realize their value as friends. A wise bot once told me a machine is stronger than its component parts. Only I had to learn that the hard way. He cares for the Dinobots after he senses sparks within them. He gives them a home. He removes upgrades when he realizes they're making him cause harm. And once he realizes that he's part of a family and he's shown himself capable of not being blinded by his own sense of power, he achieves processor over matter when he needed it most. A changed person by the end, Prowl makes the most selfless sacrifice to save our heroes and Detroit from the evil clutches of the Decepticons, with his last act being that of saving Optimus Prime. Who's the hero bot? His name is Prowl. 
War, violence, destruction. Quite ironic that's part of his story considering Ratchet is a medic. He's seen so much, and when he sees all the glorification of the war, and how great it was, and how noble it was, he gets disgusted. At the beginning of the show, Ratchet calls a propaganda video a scrap metal for talking about how noble the Autobots were, when in reality, he was a companion to an Autobot forced to being a living weapon of mass destruction. The tremendous pain of losing RC to this great war, the suffering of Omega Supreme. And that just makes it all the more satisfying when he gets both RC and Omega Supreme back with him by the end. I think this is why he's so cynical and grouchy. <laughs> Knock it off, kid! We're heading home, now! But don't let that fool you into thinking that he doesn't care. He truly does. If anything happened to you at the hands of the Decepticons, that's why we have to leave. I'd never forgive myself. I find this characterization of Ratchet that has endured beyond this incarnation really bold. It's really brave to take on something like PTSD in a kid's cartoon. Now, let's just say I have a much better appreciation for what you went through back in the day and why you don't want to remember it. It's not that I don't want to remember. I have to remember. For those who can't. Still, I don't suppose it hurts to talk about it sometimes. With a trusted friend. Also, the AllSpark key. Basically, it does Ratchet's job for him, and it renders him obsolete. I wasn't a big fan of the AllSpark key idea at first, seemed a little bit too much like a crutch, an easy plot device, but the way they masterfully took it away and transwarped to add to the growth of all the characters was amazing. It was such a stroke of genius to me. Sorry got to grow up and learn that things needed to be going at their own pace. It allowed Ratchet to prove to everyone else and himself that he is a good doctor. After not being able to save RC and Omega Supreme, he was finally able to save someone, and he didn't need a plot device to do so. Yes, this old butt isn't so obsolete after all. I may be small, but I'm scrappy. And I can run circles around your big old rusty chassis. Bumblebee is loud and obnoxious in the same way a little brother can be, but you'll love him all the same. He's incredibly courageous, loyal, and is willing to take a bullet for his friends. For me, the essence of the character is retained, which is a spunky bot who will do anything to save people. A friendly face. Reach out! I'll grab you! trust his face. Someone who risks Spark and Chassis to do the right thing. Even when he falters, he always comes around for you in the end. Bumblebee was conceived as a spy in G1, and in Animated, he's scooping out intel on multiple occasions, whether it's locating a Decepticon spy in boot camp, or at the end when he's sneaking aboard some weapons of mass destruction. I don't know if it's a reference to the original per se, but even so, it's a nice coincidence. At times he can be a glory hog, seeking fame and fortune, but all his attempts end up backfiring in the end, from getting the oil kicked out of him to sending an yes, in- bot to the stockade. Now look, Wasp wasn't a nice guy, but he didn't deserve that. And I think it's really interesting that this sort of profiling that B did is ultimately frowned upon. He let his assumptions get the better of him and ruined someone's life. And so he has the only thing he can do to make it right. I wanted to say I'm sorry. You know, for everything I did and didn't do. Ross, forgive Bumblebot. Oh, really? That Wasp and I will never forgive! Fair enough. In fact, the whole show is a sort of humbling of the Bumble. He has aspirations for the elite guard, and after he took the fall for Bulkhead's mistake so he wouldn't be booted, he got incredibly frustrated. I think it's in part because he desperately wants to fit in and be accepted. He does the grandiose stuff in order to fit in, and haven't we all felt the same way? Not just as a teenager, but into adulthood? Everyone wants that. Everyone wants to feel accepted. And oftentimes we think the best way to do that is to turn ourselves into what everyone else wants instead of becoming who we want to be. Ironically, when he realizes he didn't need any sort of approval from assholes who wouldn't take him for who he was, that all he needed was a friend and a family, that's when he got on the path to greatness. Bulkhead, I want you to know that our friendship is worth more to me than any amount of glory or membership in some elitist guard. If he never did that right thing that cost him his career, 
he never would have been on the Space Bridge crew that came back home victorious over the Decepticons. By staying true to who he is, by being Bumblebee, a compassionate, loyal, courageous friend, someone who may be small, but whose spark is huge, he got the acceptance he always wanted. <sighs> Whew, what a ride. Don't try to explain the magic. Just accept the holiday season as a time when dreams come true. It's also a time to be thankful for the things you have. Like family. Imagine you're a kid whose father, a giant tech billionaire scientist who's always working to the break of dawn, you're homeschooled by a tutor bot, and then you see these giant alien robots. They care for you, they hang out with you. These visitors from another planet in a skin that's not flesh are somehow more human than anyone you've met in your life. They feel like family. Sorry is one of those characters that starts off being someone who might come across as annoying. But to be honest, I don't think she ever was for me. She is very similar to Kicker, has issues with a neglectful father, has a special ability useful to the Autobots, and even her final suit looks similar. She isn't a point of view character, but she does serve as a human connection with the robots in Detroit. I like how she matures over the course of the show, and how she gets much closer with her father with the help of Optimus Prime. There is a bit of an unanswered question about her that would have been a point of discussion in a potential season 4. But as far as we know, she was a protoform who, with some Dex DNA, is now part organic and part Cybertronian, a techno-organic. I feel like the idea was that she would have been the evolution of the Cybertronian. I think it was a good twist in Season 2, and I like how it's a major point of growth for her in Season 3. Hey Boulder Butt! You wanna mess with my city? You gotta go through me first. From initially resenting her father and getting frustrated with not being treated as an equal, to mending that relationship and learning to take it slow. She's not as apparent in season three, which I always chalked up to her spending more time with her father. And I like that at the beginning of the show, Optimus wants her as far away as possible from a fight, but then she proves herself capable by the end. No, sorry, it's- Yeah, 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 too dangerous, I know. It's always too dangerous. I was going to say it's more important for you to protect your father and your fellow organics. Oh, right. An honorary Autobot, indeed. What? What happened? Sorry? Bumblebee, you're okay. And you're... you're different. You're a persistent little Autobot. My name is Optimus Prime! A bot driven with guilt for a decision he didn't make easily that cost him his career. Someone who squashed all hope and potential in the eyes of his superiors. I had hoped that someday you would achieve greatness. Perhaps even prove yourself a worthy Magnus. But clearly, being a hero is not in your programming. The journey from Washout Academy bot to Hero of Cybertron is not an easy one. What you should do is stick within the scope of your programming. If I need a trash can emptied or a floor mopped, I'll call on my buddy Optimus Prime. Or should I say, Maintenance Prime. <laughs> dealing with the likes of Sentinel Prime. Sentinel, as I said, is the true villain because he represents the elitism that Optimus must overcome to prove to everyone that he's a slagging hero. Hell, he even dies saving the Allspark in the third episode. He proves himself time and time again, but is rarely thanked. So this is what it feels like to be a hero. That's not to say he doesn't hit any roadblocks or makes no mistakes. There are many times he doubts himself or he messes up. The fate of the Earth and Cybertron hang in the balance and all I've got to command are a bunch of undisciplined, insubordinate malfunctions. But learns at the end what it means to be a hero and a leader. What'd you expect from a bunch of undisciplined, insubordinate malfunctions anyway? I was out of line when I said that, okay? 
And uh, maybe you maintenance bots could teach this academy bot how to repair a few friendships. Imagine being thrust with the responsibility of safeguarding the origin of life, and you're the leader of a repair crew going up against warlords and super soldiers. Yeri, Japanese word. It means the burden hardest to bear. Optimus learned to live with his Giri and respect it. Over the course of the show, Megatron doesn't even remember Optimus Prime's name. But after getting a swift beating... If I cannot save my clones, at least I'll have the satisfaction of destroying you, Optimus Prime. So you can remember my name. And that moment is so cathartic. 30 plus episodes of Megatron referring to them as Autobot. And now for Megatron to remember the one bot who beat him. Genius! And when he returns, and we see that look on Sentinel's face when he sees the repair bot took down the leader of the Decepticons. Genius! But more than that, this Prime is compassionate and right, caring and cautious, and just like every version before, he's a loyal friend. They keep the essence of being strong enough to be gentle. And they contrast that with Sentinel's all-out warmongering approach. A tale of two primes. Optimus tries to inspire. Sentinel tries to intimidate. Together, we can move mountains. Now here's a bot who knows his place. And tell your pathetic excuse for a ninja bot to remember his place. Why don't you stand up for yourself? Because he knows his place. How about I put you in your place? <laughs> Something that caught my eye in the production bible was a passage about how Sari, since she didn't see her father much, would have Optimus serve as the father she never had in the meantime. Optimus Prime serves as a father figure for Sari in the same way he served and continues to serve as a father figure for many children out there. He does whatever he can for his family, whether they be human or Autobot. And that's aided by David Kay's stellar performance. I can't help but compare these two role models. Ratchet, you and Sorry take care of Ultra Magnus. You turn it back or you turn it to ash. Bumblebee, Prowl, Bulkhead, and Fenzone, evacuate the humans from the area. You gotta try and bottleneck that portal. Slow them down. Sentinel and Jazz will take down Starscream. You got the lightning. Light the bastards up. Ratchet, seal the hull breach. Prowl, hold the ship steady. Stay here on the ground. Keep the fighting here. Bulkhead, Bumblebee, guard the all spark. And Hulk. <sighs> Smash. We're repair bots! We're not programmed for this kind of action! Then consider this an upgrade. I see this show as a sort of Smallville for Transformers, where we see a young Optimus grow into the hero we know him to be. So it's fitting that at the beginning he looks like Orion Pax, and at the end he's got the Matrix of Leadership on his chest. He truly was programmed to be a hero. I could talk about this show for hours, the way every Autobot feels like a normal person, the stellar voice acting, the music that often punctuates the show so perfectly, the other Autobots we get to meet like Jazz and Retgar and so forth, the numerous cameos, and amazing world building, combination of darker more adult themes with a dynamic exaggerated art style, it's such a great balance of light and dark. When I say this is a perfect reboot, I'm not saying that Animated is a perfect show. It has bumps like any other show does. What I am saying is that Animated is exactly the type of show that would be made today if this was the first time a TF show was ever to exist. It's consistent with what came before, but brings so much completely new and revolutionized the franchise in so many ways. So many references, fan service, etc. while being something completely unique. But I'm not gonna end this video on a sour note of I hope this show would have continued or something. Season 4 sounded great. Amazing. Fantastic. I wish it were real. But let's focus on what's ultimately important. And that's the little kid playing with an Optimus Prime toy while watching the show every morning. It's the parents who are enjoying a nostalgia trip with their kids as they see the Autobots wage their battle to destroy the evil forces of the Decepticons. It's, well, why don't I let some of those people talk about the show themselves? It's undeniable that if it wasn't for Transformers Animated, I probably wouldn't be doing YouTube to this day talking about Transformers because that's the show that brought me back into the world of Transformers. Transformers Animated really stuck with me growing up because it felt like I wasn't being talked down to. It was 
honestly pretty unique for the Transformers series, and I appreciated that so much. Transformers animated was lightning in a bottle. And I was just glued to the TV, I was watching it, and I loved all the characters, I loved the Decepticons, the Autobots, everyone. I think this was between 2011 and 2012. I saw a few episodes sometimes when I was at a friend's house and we were watching TV. We both really liked Transformers and were big fans of the movies in Prime. I have vivid memories of Total Meltdown being an episode that aired all the time. I really liked the tone. I liked the more superior aspects of the show that make it stick out as well. This is a show that deals with PTSD, loss, regret, grief and corruption. The morality is still very black and white at the end of the day, but as a kid it felt like even the quote unquote good guys weren't always on the right side of the battle. Um, the villains of all in Trap are all just really fun, especially Starscream, though I think Tom Kenny is kind of the reason why I love the Starscream so much. I thought the show was really weird for many reasons. Optimus Prime not being voiced by Peter Cullen, not being the leader of the Autobots, and being younger was I think the main one. I recall thinking Bumblebee was a badass going up the elevator like that with the wheels on his sweaty armpits. Unlike Transformers Animated, you know, it was just building upon its lore over the course of three seasons. And I remember just owning the Battle Begins uh, Deluxe 2-pack of Optimus Prime and Megatron. And when I'd go on holiday with my family, I would just religiously watch that first episode over and over and over again. And I remember thinking Bulkhead was a certified best boy. Um, Ultimus Prime is really cool, um, Prowl is absolutely awesome, he's just a badass, I love him. I was that enthusiastic with the toys that in the beginning days of my channel I would like venture out into doing stop motions with the animated toys. Still, how many 14 year old shows still have countless art pieces being released every single day? Even to the present day, you know, we've got a lot of a lore given to us from Transformers Prime to Robots in the Skies, you know, with the recent movies, it just kind of makes you think, how would animated interpret it? It was just that enriching of a lore, and I think the animated style made it distinct and unique on its own. That's why I would murder for a season 4, not just to wrap up its many loose ends, but to have Marty Eisenberg's vision explored fully and given the respect it deserves. After Transformers Animated, you can definitely tell that they heavily influenced a bunch of other series like Transformers Prime, even the movie verse. Lockdown was a character that was introduced in Transformers Animated and he became a big villain. That's really telling of the series. Lockdown is a welcome addition to the Transformers mythos. Hell, he's even one of my favorite Transformers characters of all time. All in all, it just means a lot to me. I don't know why this show and this show in particular really stood out to me. It's not even the first Transformers show I watched. Fast forward to now though, I watched the entire show twice and I love it. Plus, now I really like this version of Optimus. This little show, and this little show alone, is what makes me call myself a Transformers fan. I think it's just really cool. I think it's very cute as well. But at the same time, it's still a show for kids and it excels as a kids show as much as it does a show for a more mature audience. I think that it's a very charming show and I think you'll adore it. And that's why I'll always remember Chance was animated. It's just... It's wonderful, you know? Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, and share.